right, people, we are live on Rumble, on YouTube, on Blaze TV. And I'm still Dave Rubin, and today we've got another Friday roundtable extravaganza for you. Joining me are the host of Newsweek's The Debate, Josh Hammer, the senior meteorologist for Fox News, Janice Dean, and host of The Liz Wheeler Show, Liz Wheeler. Welcome back to The Rubin Report, everybody. Thank you for having us. Hi, Dave. I Great to be said, here, Dave. I just said welcome back, but Josh, this is your first time, so you're under a tremendous amount of pressure. I have two, old, I have two aged veterans on the other side of this, and then a new guy. Dave, I'm, I'm, I'm schwitzing over here. I don't know if you can see me, but <laughs> he's sweating He's freaking bullets. out. He's freaking out. All right, well, uh, I want to recap the week with, with you guys. You know, it was another nutty week. Every week, it's another nutty week. Uh, but a couple things that I wanted to hit on this week were CNN and Chris Cuomo, because it's just such a perfect example of corrupt media and how they're in on it with the politicians and always covering for themselves and all that stuff. Uh, we're also going to talk a bit about this Mississippi abortion case and how this may or may not affect Roe v. Wade. And then finally, uh, the Biden administration may be doing some things that that scary orange man had talked about related to Mexico and borders and everybody's freaking out. Uh, so let's start with the, the Chris Cuomo situation over at CNN. I've got some info here from uh, CNN directly, uh, when Chris admitted to us, this was the statement that they released uh, after they had temporarily suspended him. Uh, when Chris admitted to us that he had offered advice to his brother's staff, he broke our rules and we acknowledged that publicly. But we also appreciated the unique position he was in and understood his need to put family first and job second. However, these documents point to a greater level of involvement in his brother's efforts than we previously knew. As a result, we have suspended Chris indefinitely, pending further evaluation. And uh, Janice, I wanna go to you first on this one because in the last two years, you have become maybe the leading critic of Andrew Cuomo. This was very personal to you if you wanna quickly recap uh, your story there. But does any of this uh, surprise you that now he's actually suspended and do you mm -hmm. think he will remain suspended? It's a good question. Uh, I've talked to some sources over at CNN that say that he wasn't very well liked uh, and many of them couldn't believe that he hung on till this long. And so we saw it in black and white with the text messages that he was actively trying to smear the women that were going against his brother. Uh, and, you know, he likes to say, well, he's my brother and of course I'm going to help him. But he lied. Mm -hmm. you know, he lied to the audience. He lied to his bosses. Uh, he lied to everyone uh, until it was actually right there uh, from the investigation, from the AG report. So and I think the chorus was so loud from all of the media, which is, you know, one of the reasons why I started speaking out is because at the very beginning, a year and a half ago, there were really no media outlets covering Andrew Cuomo and his mandate to put COVID positive patients into nursing homes. And actually, I am grateful for the, uh, the Cuomo brothers comedy hour that began on CNN for weeks, because right. if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't have been so angry you know, my grief literally turned to anger. And the day after the big cotton swab episode, I went on Tucker Carlson to tell my story because there he was with his brother while thousands of New Yorkers are dying, joking about COVID tests, which weren't allowed in nursing homes to test incoming patients. So this has been a long time coming. Uh, you know, ethics, there have been no ethics when it comes to the Cuomo brothers being on television. Um, you know, I, I guess there's always the possibility for Chris Cuomo to come back. I hope he doesn't. He doesn't deserve to come back. And just to be clear, Jadis, uh, your your uh, in-laws both died of COVID because they were in these nursing homes. Uh, Connor, can you just put that image up again? We've got the image of these two during their, their comedy hour, as you put it. And this was at the height of the pandemic as all of these people were dying on orders by Andrew Cuomo. And there is Chris Cuomo with his giant Q-tip and they're just laughing it up. Uh, Josh, you're a critic of mainstream media. Um, does any of this surprise you? Like. I was on Fox earlier this week and they were asking, well, are you surprised? And are you, do you think that, you know, he'll come back and all that? And it's like, I'm not surprised at all. Why would I expect a, a quote unquote journalist at CNN to be doing honest reporting, especially when his brother's in involved? But that's really secondary here, I think. 
Yeah, it is secondary, but I mean, it's also important too, right? I mean, I mean, like who in their right mind, Dave, could have possibly foreseen that Chris Cuomo acting at a time as a major nighttime anchor on a major cable news channel, uh, while at the same time his brother was leading the state that was hardest hit from COVID. I mean, I mean, who could have possibly foreseen that there would be like a massive conflict of interest here? You know, and look, yeah, who, you know, could some, have? <laughs> who, who, who in their right mind could have possibly seen this happening, right? But look, th there are a lot of people on our side you know, a lot of them friends of mine, like my good friend, Jesse Kelly, I've seen Jesse kind of defend Chris a little bit, you know, within the bounds of reason, saying that he's, look, he's looking out for his family first. You saw that in the CNN statement. I, I, I actually sympathize a lot with that. Family obviously should come first. The problem is that if you want to put your family first and you're in a situation like Chris Cuomo found himself in, you have to resign your job or you have to, yeah. or you have to like, or you have to take a furlough, leave of absence, or do something where there's not just this brazen conflict of interest there. But to your broader point, Dave, Look, I mean, at the end of the day, obviously, this is this is CNN, okay? I mean, like, do we even remember like the old like CNN, like like the advertisements they were running at the beginning of the Trump presidency? Like, this is an Apple, this is not mm -hmm. fake news. We were we were gaslit for four years, and look, the whole thing is a travesty. I mean, Janice has you know did amazing work, obviously, on the Cuomo brothers issue. So thank you for your service in that respect, Janice. But none of this should surprise us really at all. I don't think. Liz, do you think he's going to get his job back? Because if you want to talk about white male privilege, as they're always talking about, it's like there's a gajillion people who would kill for that time slot. And although his ratings are pretty decent by CNN standards, they're, they're pretty much garbage. I mean, Fox has something like 27 of the top 30, uh, you know, slots in the ratings. If, if you care about cable news ratings, it's like, why wouldn't they just get rid of him and give some, give somebody a chance? I mean, a little diversity. Well, listen, if we're looking at CNN's track record, then Chris Cuomo will get his spot back because yep. they allowed Jeffrey Tubin, um, the disgusting creep who masturbated on a Zoom call, a company work call, they suspended him and then allowed him back on air. So if we're looking at CNN's track record here, then yes, he will get his slot back once the mainstream media has managed to bury this story. But I, I just want to pivot back to what's most important here. Obviously, Chris Cuomo is a total creep. Obviously, he is a stain on the word journalism. A you know, he's he's a journalistic hack, a partisan journalistic hack. And I would push back against Jesse Kelly. I actually did on my show this week against Tucker Carlson echoed this a little bit, too. And Josh did just a little bit today. Not quite as much. <laughs> I don't think there's any virtue in um, the idea of coming to the defense of your family member when your family member has allegedly committed a crime. I mean, if my brother robbed a bank, I wouldn't come and try to cover for him. If my mm. sister had a dead body in her trunk, I wouldn't help her hide it. You don't help. It's it's not putting family first to help somebody who just happens to be blood related, commit a crime or try to cover that up or try to ruin somebody else's life. So this, this narrative that's coming from CNN that Chris Cuomo just got confused about his priorities, that he was just putting family first. No, absolutely not. This whole thing is a distraction from what Janice very heroically exposed at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And Janice, by the way, your in-laws must be so proud of you. Aww. I'm so proud of you. You're a hero for taking down Governor Cuomo because the crux of the matter is the most important thing here is that he sent thousands of elderly people in the state of New York to their deaths by forcing nursing homes to accept COVID positive patients. And then he tried, then he lied about it to try to cover it up. We shouldn't let CNN become a distraction from that. Janice, speaking to, to what uh, Liz just mentioned, I mean, even though Andrew Cuomo was taken out in essence because of the, the sexual assault allegations, you must be feeling pretty good that he's not the governor, although actually the governor that this, this new one, this, what's her name, uh, Corchel yeah. or? Kathy Corchel? Hochul. 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 I mean, sh she's in some ways far more authoritarian than even he was, but but how do you sort of generally feel about the fact that he is no longer governor after after you did so much work to expose him? I wish she was impeached. Uh, resignation is not impeachment. It's not accountability. And I think he struck a deal uh, with Carl Heastie, the speaker, and uh, some of the lawmakers, because I think they told him, listen, you're, pretty, you're about to be impeached. You need to do the right thing and resign. If you resign, then we'll stop the impeachment process. Mm -hmm. We'll stop the investigation, which is what happened once he resigned. They recently um, you know, released all of the paperwork that they were undergoing with, with the investigation, uh, but they stopped it and they stopped short of the nursing home issue. Yep. Imagine that. Um, so Listen, although it's great not to see his face on television every day, uh, I, I still think there needs to be accountability. There's still investigations by the DOJ and the FBI into the nursing home uh, situation. The fact that for months and months he covered up the numbers to sell his $5.2 million book, which was written by state resources. 
Uh, so all of those things are still under investigation. And of course, his horrific behavior with women. Josh, does this story, the, the Cuomo brothers story, kind of lead you to like, well, everybody in the media, mainstream media is kind of in on it. Like you're either reporting on your brother or on an administration you used to work for or on a press secretary that was used to be your assistant or just like almost everyone is so deeply connected in the media to the people that they're reporting on. It's like, this is all just obvious, isn't it? So it's really not even just the mainstream media that's in on the act here. It's really kind of just like the broader, like ruling class more generally in this country. I mean, if, if the people who are giving out Emmy awards are willing to kind of completely overlook everything that Jazz was talking about from the very get-go about the nursing mm -hmm. homes and all that and give this man an Emmy at the same time that he was going around writing a book about his triumphs on this subject, I mean, the whole thing just stinks to high heaven, Dave. I mean, like, I, 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 everyone should really kind of be up in their arms about that. And look, I, I agree with, with everything that Janice and Liz have said. I mean, hopefully Chris Cuomo does not come back to his perch, but I sadly predict he probably will, to be honest. Liz, even though this is sort of good for us watching the mainstream media collapse and then the alternate, alternative or whatever you want to call it, the online media grow, it's sort of depressing, right? Like, don't you wish these guys were a little bit better? I always say it's like, they don't have to be great. I just wish they weren't like abjectly horrible. Yeah, I don't call it alternative media. I call it honest media because that's what we are. Those of us who are independent, like you and I, we are the honest. We're trying at least. Yeah, and, I mean, when we do make mistakes, we own up to it, we correct. That's because we're human beings. That's, that's acting with journalistic integrity. Um, even if we're opinion commentators. But yes, the, the reason that it's so upsetting to see the mainstream media outlets lie um, and carry water for the Democratic Party, act as the propaganda arm for this radical leftist ideology, this Marxist agenda that the left has, is because it's, it's not truly a matter of just competing with these with these companies, right? You have you have this sort of crony capitalism that goes on, and I don't need to tell you this. This is a, exactly what you're doing with locals. You actually are working and fighting to be a competition to big tech, which is another another of the same, another in the same category as the mainstream media that is simply trying to stifle conservatives. But it's not really a fair playing field. So you can't just bring your opinion to the court of public opinion and have it compete against the left. You can't necessarily start a cable channel and just compete against CNN because there is so much crony capitalism, whether it's the cable providers who own some of the cable channels, whether it's you know the government making it possible or not. I mean, it, it's not really a fair playing field. And so it's very hard to compete. So it is frustrating when you know that there are are many Americans who their only source of news is this, you know, this lying, this lying leftist media. Hey, I guess it gives us all something to do when we wake up in the morning. So uh, that's, that's pretty good. <laughs> all right, let's, uh, let's move on to the second, the second story, which really was the big story of the week. Uh, the Supreme Court heard initial arguments about this Mississippi abortion case, which basically everyone is now saying could lead potentially to a reversal on Roe v. Wade. We've got some info from the Daily Wire. On Wednesday, the Supreme Court heard arguments concerning a case regarding a Mississippi abortion law that could have massive implications for pro-life laws around the country. The case, Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, concerns a 2018 law in Mississippi that bans most abortions after 15 weeks of preg pregnancy. As the law stands now, Roe v. Wade and the decisions that came after it hold that states have to allow a woman to be able to get an abortion up to the point of viability or when the baby can survive on its own outside the womb. Most states hold this mark at around 20 to 24 weeks. Uh, Josh, I wanna start with you on this one. I saw you at the National Conservatism Conference. Uh, the Roe v. Wade decision generally was one of the big things being talked about and how much the courts will get involved in all of this and will it get to the Supreme Court and everything else. Uh, what do you make about the arguments that we heard in the last couple of days? Yeah, so from my vantage point, Dave, this is kind of like the legal constitutional issue of all constitutional issues. It has obviously deeply divided America for for literally the past half century. Roe versus Wade, you know, was January of 1973, so we're coming up on the 49th anniversary of it. It, it was famously um, largely affirmed 19 years later in the 1992 case of Planned Parenthood versus Casey, and the Dobbs case out of Mississippi. And the underlying statute is basically a 15 week gestational ban on abortion with limited exceptions for after 15 weeks. But that's basically the statute. It, it does directly put in its crosshairs both Roe and Casey. And this is the best opportunity that pro-lifers have had for a modicum of sanity on, on the abortion issue, really since the Casey case in 1992. 
And, you know, I listened to the entirety of oral argument. I mean, from kind of a pro-life and really as a constitutionalist perspective, because, you know, as your very well-informed audience obviously knows, Roe versus Wade was completely concocted. I mean, like they made up a bunch of crap, basically the penumbras, the emanations, all, all of this was just totally philosophized from the bench in pretty egregious fashion here. And the, the, the very modest claim that kind of the anti-Roe side, or at least most on the anti-Roe side make, is that the Constitution doesn't speak to this matter and that it's properly an, an issue for the for the 50 state legislatures. So, some of us actually do go a little further than that, but the kind of neutral middle ground position, which is kind of the mainstream, I would say, constitutionalist perspective, is that the Constitution just allows this issue to go to the states. And I, I personally was actually, I listened to the entirety of oral argument on Wednesday. I was quite happy with what I heard, to be honest with you. I mean, even Justice Kavanaugh, who I think is considered one of kind of the swing justices on this case, really kind of came out swinging. I mean, he seems to have intuited that this leave it to the state's position is the neutral middle ground position here. So I feel confident predicting that they're going to find a way to uphold the Mississippi statute. The million dollar question is, will it be some some sort of like muddled kind of incremental, you know, John Roberts special or will they actually go the full way and actually overturn all of it? I, but I, I will say I have a lot of friends who even some friends who clerked on the Supreme Court who were texting me afterwards. They were they were really happy with what they heard. It probably couldn't have gone a whole lot better, honestly. Yeah. And for the record, I, I discussed this with Liz a couple of weeks ago. I mean, I do consider myself begrudgingly pro-choice really to about 12 weeks I, without getting too far down that road. But I do kind of understand this position of this is not an, a constitutionally guaranteed right. So you should kick it back to the states. I don't love making that argument. Uh, and I, I get the I get it on both sides. But I, that makes sense to me. Janice, what's what's your take on this? Listen, uh, the divided issue, right? We're already uh, a United States that is divided, and this one is going to divide us more. Uh, when you look at somebody like Kathy Hochul, who is saying, come on down to New York City. Uh, we're open for this procedure, whoever mm-hmm. wants it. I mean, that's that's difficult to hear. I, I have two children. I am a Catholic. I am pro-life. Uh, what I don't want to see is this as a substitute uh, for birth control. I don't want teenagers to think, oh, well, you know, I can go out and do this. And and I have so many things that I can go to, including this option, which I think is terrible. Um, And I have so many friends that are craving for babies in their life. They can't Mm -hmm. have children for whatever reason, and they are dying to adopt. Uh, You know, I think if education goes towards other options of having a child and giving it to loving family members, I think that that's really important. And, and I wish that we would we would get to, to something like that, where we have more education to, here's something that you can do, you can have a child and give it to a family that wants one so badly. Yeah, well said. I mean, solutions. It's like if there were more nonprofits, I know that many of them exist, but if there were more nonprofits that would help women who say did not want the child for whatever reason, get that child to to be adopted or fostered or whatever, maybe that helps a little bit. Liz, is there any middle ground here? Like this is just the one because it brings up philosophical issues and scientific issues and religious issues, all the existential issues, they're all on the table here. We can't agree on basic things anymore that two plus two equals four. So it's like, is there anything we can get to on this? Well, listen, the American people, I mean, if you if you ignore the elected officials in Washington, D.C. on both sides of the aisle, the American people actually agree on this issue. Over 80 percent of the American people want abortion banned in the third trimester. Over 60 percent of the American people, this, by the way, is both conservative and liberal, pro-abortion and pro-life, want abortion banned in the second trimester. The overwhelming majority of people do agree on abortion. They do want restrictions. It's just the very far leftist politicians who ignore that. But I, I echo a little bit of what Josh said. I listened to the entire arguments. It was about two hours worth in front of the Supreme Court. And I was shocked, actually, by how we the arguments from the pro-abortion side were. Their arguments were essentially twofold. They argued that because it was, quote unquote, settled law, it's precedent. It's been, you know, law for what, like almost 60 years um, that it can't be Yeah, it's just and, not Which true. is ridiculous. I mean, it's, yeah. that's completely contradictory. Yeah, to our entire legal history. I mean, look at something like Plessy versus Ferguson. That was overturned by Brown versus Board of Education. That was about racial segregation. So mm-hmm. that argument doesn't hold any water. And then their second argument was um, an argument just about woman a woman's choice a woman's body yet they didn't mention anything about the baby's body which is the com- the, the competing legal interest as we all know here I thought the arguments from that side were actually very weak I was very encouraged after hearing this 
um, after hearing these arguments. And it was very interesting to hear what some of the justices said, some of the swing justices, how Robert was Roberts was very interested in the idea of viability. Mm -hmm. Kavanaugh was very interested in the idea of the Supreme Court being neutral on um, on the question of abortion. These are very this is going to be very interesting um, to watch, very interesting to see. And I know I. Uh, many of your viewers, I'm sure, are joining me and praying for these nine justices after they've heard this argument. We won't find out until June what their decision will be. Yeah, and also, I mean, I did watch most of it, and I do have to say I thought that the, the pro-life arguments were just better. Like, it's exactly what you're saying. They, they were more thoughtful where the others were, cause, because there just simply is no constitutional right to an abortion. I mean, Bernie tweeted it out right. this morning, and it's like, no, that's not in the Constitution. We can talk about Roe v. Wade, but like, it's, just not there. All right, we got one more for you guys. Uh, you remember that orange guy with the funny hair, Donald Trump, and he was always talking about Mexico and a border and all that stuff. Uh, well, now Biden, who used to call him racist, is sort of doing a lot of the things or wants to do a lot of things uh, that Trump was doing. Uh, we've got some info here from The Blaze. The Biden administration has reached a deal this week with the Mexican government to relaunch the Trump era Remain in Mexico program. The program, officially known as Migrant Protection Protocols, was implemented in 2019 under Trump and requires migrants seeking asylum in the U.S. to stay in Mexico while they wait for their U.S. court hearings. By establishing the program, Trump aimed to prevent migrants traveling to the southern border through Mexico from disappearing before their court hearings and thus avoiding potential deportation. I mean, that sounds pretty sane to me. And yet, of course, it was called racist about two years ago. Now it's being ushered in by the Biden administration, which, by the way, I don't know if you guys saw this, but like an hour ago, uh, Fauci called it the Wuhan virus. That was something Trump was always called racist for, too. Yeah, he actually called it the Wuhan virus. I just saw it this morning. Um, oh, my gosh. Liz, let me throw to you on this one first. I mean, we should just sort of move past the hypocrisy, right? Like, that's not the surprising part here. Sane policy, is that the surprising part? Well, listen, don't give the Biden administration more credit than they deserve. They haven't come to their senses. They're not re-implementing this policy because it makes sense. They're doing so because a court is making them. A court <laughs> is forcing them to. And the court even said that they have to implement this policy, again, in good faith, meaning they can't try to get around it here. But I mean, this policy is a good policy. It makes sense. And I'll tell you why it makes sense. It makes sense because if we have all of these migrants who are essentially falsely claiming asylum just because they want to be released into the United States, um, we have to ask, okay, well, how many of them show up for their court dates after they have been you know, detained by the Border Patrol and then released into the United States and given a court date, told to come back to have their asylum claim adjudicated? How many of them actually come back? Well, there was um, one particular judge who said that over 90 percent of the migrants that she gave court dates to did not show up for their hearing. Well, no right. kidding. That's human nature. I mean, Dave, would you show back up? I probably wouldn't, <laughs> to be honest. In this situation, I wouldn't, yeah. if I'm being honest. They're not. So, of course, then this is this is just a, a soft form of amnesty. This is a way of allowing migrants, regardless of whether their asylum claims are legitimate, to just you know, fade into the shadows into the United States. Of course, the Biden administration didn't want to do this. But the thing is, without this policy, what happens is what's happening at the border right now, a travesty. I mean, the Biden administration's policies on immigration are anti-woman, they're anti-child, and they're anti-immigrant. Let And that's not even taking into account the fact that it's dangerous for our national security and a burden on welfare. One in three women and children are sexually assaulted on their way to cross the border after they cross the border while still in these cartel trafficking houses. It is anti-immigrant, anti-woman, and anti-child to put a policy in place knowing that it will lead to the bodily harm of these people just so that the cartels and the coyotes can make a buck off of it. By the way, it's also basically pro-COVID because Fauci was asked this week about, you know, vaccines for people on airplanes coming into the country and masks and all that. And he's like, yeah, yeah, that's all good. And then they asked him about, you know, people crossing the southern border illegally. He's like, well, that's something else. I mean, it's just <laughs> so bananas. Josh, bananas, It's also is not the true, right by word? the way, what he said. Yeah. It's not true what Fauci said. Fauci said that there are some people that are getting tested. It is not a widespread policy. You can ask any Border Patrol agent, any ICE agent. This is not a widespread thing. They are not testing on any kind of large scale basis. No, you can just see the video that they only show you on Fox actually with just thousands yeah. of people and they're not social distancing either. Uh, Josh, I, su I suppose you're not surprised by any of this. No, I mean, look, we all remember the videos from Del Rio, Texas, which, of course, was like the big hot topic of the day just like a month and a half, two months ago or so here. I mean, the Biden administration has they've been disastrous on, on a lot of issues, obviously. I mean, Af Afghanistan, the withdrawal there was particularly egregious, I would say. But I, I, I'm holding aside like perhaps the Afghanistan kind of 
crap show. It really, it, it, immigration and the border in particular has been the one area where I think they have consistently and repeatedly erred most egregiously here. And Liz is totally right to mention that they're only doing this on a, a literally due to a, a, a judicial decree and a, from, from, from a very good judge, by the way, a Judge Kazmarek in Amarillo, Texas. I, I was very, I should probably say I was very briefly colleagues with him before he was tapped for the bench. He's a, he's, he's a wonderful conservative, so he did the right thing here, of course. But, you know, I, I've actually talked over the years with a lot of kind of DOJ folks, both while I was serving in the Trump administration and, both, and afterwards. They literally unanimously have told me that of all the various policies that the Trump administration put into place, MPP was by far the most effective at actually stemming the tide of legal immigration for the extremely common sense logical reason that is exactly what Liz said, which is if you get past the border, we have this ridiculous catch and release policy going back mm-hmm. to the Obama administration when Jay Johnson was secretary of Homeland Security. And when you're released into the interior, as Liz said, of course, you're not going to show up. This is just such common sense. So, look. I mean, I, I I guess we could say good for the Biden administration on this. I mean, again, like they're literally just doing it at the force of like a judicial gun. I, I guess in theory they could like choose to defy the court order. So good for them for not defying this completely sane and proper court order. But look, I, the situation on the border is egregious for all the parties involved. Like Liz said, it's not just the ranchers. It's not just the people living on the border. It's terrible for them, too, obviously. But the cartels we're talking here about, about the transnational cartels, the Sinaloa, folks like that operate operating in northern Mexico, we are talking about the most vicious non-state actors in the entire Western hemisphere. Like these people are brutal. So we don't want to empower them at all. We should be defanging them at any and all possibilities. And MPP is a very, very simple and straightforward way to do that. So Jana says the person here that works for really the only cable news network that's covering this at all and then got banned at some point, I think Fox even had helicopters up there and drones that then were told they couldn't be up there. Do you sense we have any real idea of the numbers of people that have come in in the last year, whether they have COVID or not, where they are, whether they brought kids, whether they're getting welfare, et cetera, et cetera? I think you know the answer. It's absolutely, we're not. We're not getting those numbers at all. And listen, I'm Canadian. uh, And by, by birth, I have dual citizenship. My father was American. Uh, I came to the land of opportunity and I understand what it's like to want to come to America and make a life for yourself because this is the greatest country in the world. Uh, And I still had a mound of paperwork to fill out uh, to get to get into this wonderful country. So I understand why these people want to come here, but you have to do it the right way. You have to. Yeah. And by the way, you know, Canadians right now, speaking of Canada, cannot leave the country or get on a plane or get on a train if they're unvaccinated. I I assume that, do you have family there that perhaps is not thrilled about this at the moment? Uh, You know what? I didn't see my mom for over a year and a half. We recently saw her in the summer and the hoops that she had to go through. Uh, She's almost 80 years old. And to get here, uh, Air Canada was a mess because uh, they just didn't have the workers. So she was in the airport for like 12 hours both ways to try to get here. Uh, And the vaccination process was really difficult in Canada as well. Uh, We're trying to go there at Christmas time. I don't know if we're going to get there because of, you know, the restrictions and 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 how tough it is to to get with with the vaccinations and 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 their government. So, guys, I always try to end my Friday shows on a positive note so people can put down politics for the weekend and act like real people and maybe eat food and see friends and listen to music and all (laughs) all that kind of stuff. So I want you to each to give me one positive thing. It can be personal, political, whatever that's going to take you into the weekend. Liz, you're up. Oh, I'm going to spend my weekend chasing after my 10 month old daughter who is fascinated by the Christmas tree and thinks that it is her specific duty to pull off all of the ornaments. So it's uh, magical and tiring and wonderful. (laughs) And I met her in Orlando and she is absolutely gorgeous. Josh. Thank you. Dave, I'm a huge college football fan. Tomorrow's a huge day on the college football calendar. We've got a lot of conference championship games. Number one, Georgia, I think, has the best chance to finally get past Nick Saban in Alabama. They have come tantalizingly close before. I I don't necessarily root against Alabama, but it's nice to see a different team other than Alabama win every so often. So I personally will be pulling for Georgia tomorrow. Lots of other good games in the calendar as well. So from a sports fan's perspective, tomorrow should be a great day. 
Janice, now that you don't have to poke your Andrew Cuomo voodoo doll anymore, what are you going to do this weekend? Oh, I still have that voodoo doll. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, listen, uh, you know, I get up at 3 a.m. every single morning and it's Friday, so I get to sleep in tomorrow. Uh, so I'm excited about that. We're going to put up our Christmas tree. Very nice. Very nice. Well, it was great seeing you guys. I'm going to finish up for a couple minutes without you, but have a good weekend. And Thank I'll have you. you guys all back as soon as you're willing to come back. Sounds good. Thanks, Dave. Have a good weekend, guys. All right, everybody. That's it for Friday. Another week down. Yeah, it all feels kind of nutty, but I hope that you will do exactly what the three of them just mentioned, which is something that brings you a little joy in your life, whether it's playing with your kids or watching football or poking an Andrew Cuomo or Gavin Newsom voodoo doll, whatever works for you guys. Uh, I do want to mention one other thing, which is obviously this was a big week uh, related to the Rumble and Locals situation. The, the company now with Cantor Fitzgerald went public. We have huge, huge plans. And as I've said many times, the goal here is to restore a free, a free and fair internet, an open internet where you, you're not going to be censored based on your political opinions. That's what we're planning on doing. Uh, you know, there'll be the front ending video side of it on the Rumble front. There'll be the, the sort of Amazon AWS, Amazon Web Services replacement, the underbelly of the internet, the subscription side of it, all of it. We're working on payment processors, everything else. We feel like this gives us a chance. This gives us a chance. I think we've teamed with the right people. Chris, who is uh, the CEO of Rumble, retains control. Asaf, who is the CEO of Locals, retains control. We're building something great, and uh, I'm glad that so many of you are, are along the ride with us. So uh, that's it. We've got a couple other big announcements over the next week or two. I've been hinting. Here, I'll send you one of my patented messages through the pipes. You got it? Ah, some of you got it. Some of you got it. Good work, people. Anyway, have a good weekend, everybody. See you on Monday.